What does immutability mean? In response, I would just ask you to hang with me for a few minutes and let's see if we can make some sense of this. I think that once we get on the other side of this topic, you will see how practical and how relevant this theological concept can be for your daily life. And actually, that is exactly where I want to begin this message. I want to explain to you how I came to the decision of talking about immutability on Mother's Day. A while back, Kenny and Chad and I began looking at the preaching schedule for May and June. And as it turned out, I was assigned Mother's Day. As you would expect, I immediately began thinking about some verses in Scripture that I could teach on. I had a couple of thoughts in mind. I had a couple of verses that I wanted to look at. Uh, but one afternoon while I was taking a break and honestly just scrolling through Facebook and trying to kill some time and let my mind rest, I saw something that intrigued me. And if you are on active, if you are active on Facebook, I'm sure that you have seen these uh, these as well over the past few months. But what I saw was several posts from friends who were moms on Facebook, and they were they were posting these funny memes about how they were struggling uh, having their kids in the house 24/7. And there were these other moms who were making comments about how they were trying to work from home and, and deal with all the chaos that was around them. I saw others that were talking about how lonely they were and how much of a struggle they were having trying to stay on top of the housework while the whole family is at home. They put something away and 30 seconds later the kid has it drugged back out, which I have three kids of my own, I can strongly relate to that. Um, and so these moms were just passing these memes around, they're just making light of the situation and trying to deal with it, deal with the stress that, that comes from being in lockdown for a month. Now, like I said, they were just posting these things that were funny, and trust me, some of them are hilarious. But I'm sure many of you are familiar with the old saying, a lot of truth is said in jest. So just because somebody may say something in a joking manner or they may kid around and say something doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't mean what they said or it isn't true or it isn't really how they feel. And so it was that half an hour that I spent on Facebook that day that led me to talk about God's attributes on Mother's Day. Now. With that being said, let's begin looking at this topic by reading a verse of Scripture. So, if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. And this is what Jeremiah has to say. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in himself in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. So, in these couple of verses, God says, let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. And then God proceeds to tell us something about himself. God tells us he is steadfast. God tells us that he is loving. He is just. And he is righteous. Well, these are attributes of God. So you can see the process here. All we are doing is looking at the Bible and trying to see what God has revealed about Himself. What is His character like? What pleases Him? What, what displeases Him? 
What are some of the different qualities these had, that he has? These are just questions that we want answers to. And we go to the scripture to find those. And so I think it's very foundational and very, very important that we develop a habit of not only reading the scriptures, but also contemplating the being who is our God. We need to search the scriptures to see what God says about himself so that we may worship him in all of his majesty. If we develop this habit in our lives, it will keep us from idolatry. It will keep us from forming our own ideas of who God is, what He is like, and how He should act. I hope that this makes sense to you. We want to worship the God who is, and not the one that we have made up in our minds. And so, one of the ways that we form this correct view of God is by looking at His attributes. Now, as we saw in Jeremiah, the passage that we read a minute ago, when I say attributes, this is simply a word that describes different qualities that God has. So, for example, if I said that my wife, Leslie, has the attributes of beauty and wisdom, right? I would be telling you something of her character, right? She is wise. She is smart. She's cunning. But I would also be telling you something that is inherent in her, which would be her beauty. These are attributes that my wife has. Now, Let's use that same concept, except let's use God as our subject. I'm going to briefly walk us through three attributes. And with these three attributes, I'm going to give two supporting passages from our Bible. Just so you can see how this concept works. And those three attributes are omniscience, omnipotence and omnipresence. I'm sure that you notice that these three attributes have the prefix omni attached to them. Omni is the Latin word for all. So when we say God is omniscient, we are saying that God is all-knowing. Omnipotence means that God is all-powerful. Omnipresence means that God is always present. So you can see, this isn't, it isn't that complicated. But after we look at these initial three, we will then look at a fourth attribute of God, which is immutability. And we will look at that one in more detail because I want to show you how it applies to Mother's Day. So let's look at our first, first of our three initial attributes. The first is omniscience. Omniscience is when we say that God knows everything. He knows everything that was. He knows everything that is. And He knows everything that is to come. But His knowledge is not limited to events on a timeline. His knowledge pierces our innermost being. We can see an example of this in Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6. And here is what King David has to say in this psalm. O Lord, You have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. 
Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. So in this passage, David is acknowledging that God not only knows what is taking place out in the world, He knows when you rise up. He knows when you lay down. He also knows what is taking place deep down in your soul, in your heart. David says that God can discern your thoughts from afar. He knows what you're going to say before you say it. There's nowhere we can go to hide from this God. Not even deep down in our innermost thoughts. That is what this psalm is saying. God's knowledge is on a whole other level. He is not like us. Another verse that could be used for an example of God's omniscience would be Psalm 94, verse 8. And this psalm says, Understand, O dullest of the people, fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? He who disciplines the nations, does he not rebuke? He who teaches man knowledge, the Lord knows the thoughts of man and that they are but a breath. Here again, we see a declaration of God's perfect knowledge. The psalmist is asking a series of rhetorical questions. He is saying, are you so foolish that you think the one who created your eyeballs can't see? Do you think the one who gave you sight is blind? And it's the same with knowledge. God is the one who dispenses knowledge to humanity. Do you think he's unlearned? God knows the thoughts of man. And he knows that their thoughts are nothing in comparison to his. Man's thoughts are but a breath. They are fleeting. Here one moment and gone the next. These are verses and there are many, many more that show us something of God's attribute of omniscience. He knows all things. And he knows them perfectly. Now, let's look at God's attribute of omnipotence. This attribute affirms that God is all-powerful. That no enemy can thwart his plans or keep him from fulfilling his desires. He is able to accomplish all that he decides to do. A verse that would support this idea is Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17. Here the prophet writes, O Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Jeremiah is acknowledging that God is the one who had the power to create our world and everything in it. If God is capable of producing all of creation, then Jeremiah knows that nothing is too hard for his God. Another verse that we could use as an example is Daniel chapter 4, verse 35. Do you remember the story where Nebuchadnezzar's pride got the best of him and God humbled him to the point where he was eating grass from the field like a wild animal? God was gracious to Nebuchadnezzar and one day he gave him his senses back. And this was the profession that Nebuchadnezzar made after that experience. Daniel chapter 4, verse 35. All the inhabitants of the earth 
are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? The old king had learned a valuable lesson, had he? Now he knew something of the power of God. The God that we serve is, is mighty. And no power on earth or in the heavens can stand against him. He does what he wills because he is omnipotent. All right, this will be our last introductory attribute. And this is God's omnipresence. This term speaks of God's ability to see all things at all times. Wayne Grudel, in his systematic theology, defines this attribute by saying, there is nowhere in the entire universe, on land or sea, in heaven or in hell, where one can flee from God's presence. I think Wayne Grudem did a good job of summing up this attribute. He gave a good definition of the point that we're trying to make. So if we were wanting to see a supporting passage for this, this attribute, we could look at the prophet Jeremiah again. This time we would go to chapter 23, verse 24. And this is what it says. Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not feel heaven and earth, declares the Lord? It's pretty clear in this verse that God sees you. You cannot hide from him. In the negative sense, this would mean that he sees you when you are sinning in private and you think no one else will ever know. God sees you. More comforting, He sees you when you're suffering. He sees you in your time of distress. He sees your pain. You are not hidden from His eyes. Another text that we could use to illustrate God's omnipresence is Psalm 139. We visited this psalm earlier and looked at verses 1 through 6. This time, let's look at verses 7 through 10. Here, King David writes, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. David understood that no matter where he went, God's eyes would be upon him. But notice what he said in that last verse. Your right hand will uphold me. David took comfort in the fact that God's eyes were upon him. David knew that God not only saw him, but that he cared for him. My hope is that by now you understand what we mean when we use the phrase attributes of God. We are talking about qualities that are inherent to God. We are using God's revelation of Himself in the Scriptures to draw conclusions about His character and His being. I cannot express to you how important it is to have a firm understanding of these things. This is the God that we claim to love and serve. If that is true, wouldn't we want to know Him as intimately as possible? And here's something else that we need to consider. So far, 
I have barely scratched the surface on three attributes. I gave you enough so that you have a general idea, a basic concept of how these things work. But we're about to look at a fourth one in more detail. But there are so many more attributes to God. Whole books have been written discussing these matters. And I would plead with you to dig into this subject. Because here's the thing. The deeper you go in your knowledge of God, the higher your worship will be of Him. You won't have to depend on emotional music to get you in the mood to worship. You won't have to depend on guys like me or Kenny or Chad to get you excited about God. Your personal knowledge of Him, derived from the Scriptures, will take you to the heights of worship that no song and no preacher can take you. The fact that this being, this God, who is so high above us, so transcendent, so majestic, would reveal Himself to us and tell us about who He is, is simply amazing. When you know who God is, it makes the Bible come alive and it makes your soul come alive. So again, I plead with you, dig in. Get, get to know your God. Now what next? Let's look at one more attribute this morning. Let's look at the attribute of immutability. And like I said, we're going to dig in a little deeper on this one. We're going to go into a little more depth. And here's the reason that I want to dig in a little deeper on this one. I don't want you to think that these attributes are ivory tower intellectual arguments that don't have real world implications. I want us to see very practically how God's attribute of immutability can provide comfort to a mom stuck at home during a global pandemic. How it can help a mom who is struggling to get through her day when everything around her seems to be falling apart. God's immutability can help you in your time of stress. So let's begin by defining the term immutability. What is it? What does it mean? Where do we see it in the Scriptures? Immutability, according to Webster's Dictionary, simply means not capable of change. So, in theological circles, immutability is a big fancy word that simply means that God does not change. That is it. It's not a hard concept to grasp. God does not change. So where do we see this concept in Scripture? One of the most obvious places in our New Testament is James chapter 1, verse 17. James writes, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Now, did you catch that second part of the verse where it says the Father of lights with whom there is no variation and there is no shadow due to change? Of course, we know the Father of lights is who? It's God. He gets that title because He is the one who created the sun, the moon, and the stars. But here is the distinction that James is making. These light sources create shadows, right? As the earth rotates, shadows move. If you think about it, that's how a sundial works. Things are in motion. They are constantly moving. Therefore, the shadows move. But that is not how it works with the Father of lights. With Him, there is no shadow. There is no variation. Why? 
Because he's unmovable. He is unchanging. God's character, his power, his wisdom, and his love have no variation. They have no shifting shadow. So in this verse, James is calling to our attention the fact that God does not change. The way God is today is the way He has always been since eternity's past. Let's look at a couple of other verses that I think state this idea clearly. Let's look at Malachi 3, verse 6. It's a very short verse. It says simply this. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. In the context of the book of Malachi, Israel, the nation, was in deep sin. Yet God did not destroy them. He was giving them an opportunity to repent. So in this verse, God is reminding them of the unchanging nature of His promises. Basically, He is saying to Israel, you better be glad that I do not change my promises. The promises that I made to your forefathers, the promises that I made to Jacob, or I would wipe you off the face of the map because of your grievous sin. But God is faithful to His promises. So in this passage we see God's promises are unchanging. Let's look at one more. Hebrews 13, verses 7 through 8. And it says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So in the context of this passage, the readers of this letter are being encouraged to please God by remembering the lifestyle of the leaders and imitating their faith. Right? These are the people that first brought up the gospel, so you need to imitate them. But what's insinuated here is that those leaders aren't there anymore. Or they wouldn't have to remember them. So the writer of Hebrews gives them a subtle reminder in verse 8. Leaders come and go. But Jesus Christ, whom you have trusted and followed, is the same today as He was yesterday. And He will remain the same forever. So what does the writer of Hebrews appeal to as the foundation for Christian faith and obedience? God's unchanging character. So we've seen some of the scriptural basis for making a claim of immutability. And, and there are many, many other verses we could use if we had time. But now let's look at some of the implications of immutability. And I just want to touch on three of them this morning, just, just again to give us a basic understanding. God does not change in His character. God's morals are always the same. He doesn't decide that something is okay today and wrong tomorrow. What God in His Word has declared to be good will for all eternity be good and right. And the things that God declares to be wrong and evil will always be wrong. He does not change His character to conform to the shifting values of this world. God's morals and His character are always and forever the same. Number two, there is no change in His sovereignty. That simply means that God is in control of everything in this world. And whatever God commands is going to happen. And nothing can happen from His allowing it. Even global pandemics. And this also will never change. 
Number three, there is no change in God's promises. When God says He's going to do something, He will make sure that His promises are fulfilled. God does not waver in His faithfulness. He is not like you and I. We may tell our friends that we're going to do something and then later forget to do it. When God declares a promise to someone, it is good as done. And this also can never change. So, up to this point, we have discussed the concept. We have talked a little bit about the implications. Now we're getting to the point where the rubber meets the road. Why is this attribute of God important? Why take the time to learn what immutable means? Why do we have, what do we have to gain from this? How does this concept help struggling mothers and every other Christian? Well, I have a feeling I don't have to work very hard to convince you that there is very little that is stable in this world. The only thing that seems to be a constant in this world is that things around us are always changing. Let me give you a few examples. We all here at Beach Grove live in East Tennessee. I'm going to assume that you are like me and you absolutely love our Smoky Mountains. My family loves to go hiking and camping. I mean, we just really, really enjoy being in the mountains. We enjoy the fresh air. We enjoy the waterfalls. We enjoy the wildlife. We, we love everything about it. Actually, one of the highlights of my day is when I drive to work in the mornings. There is a spot over on 321 next to our house uh, where you will go over a crest of a hill. And when you do, on a clear day, the, it's like the whole mountains are laid bare before you. You can, see, you can see everything. It takes my breath away every time I see it. And from my car, it seems that the Smoky Mountains are unchanging. For the past 16 years, that view from the windshield of my car has never changed. Not once. But I know that over time, my beloved Smoky Mountains are subject to change. They suffer the effects of erosion and things like that. I think all of us watched in horror a few years ago when the fires came through and devastated Gatlinburg. And the reality is these outside forces could, they could alter the way our mountains look. So if the mountains were the only place that I derived pleasure from. There's a great potential to feel heartbroken because I know that any moment they're subject to change. A natural disaster could take my source of pleasure away in a heartbeat. What about our families? Are they subject to change? Now my intention is not to make this sermon all about me but I do want to tell you a little bit about my history because I, I think it will go a long way to help you see how relevant God's immutability is when it relates to families. My parents got divorced when I was seven years old. I was the only child in the family. And as is the case in most situations like this, my mom and dad uh, each remarried other people. The man that my mom married had five daughters from a previous marriage. The woman that my dad married had a boy and a girl from a previous marriage. So for me, this means that I went from being an only child to having seven stepbrothers and stepsisters. Let me tell you, that's a big change. And not only that, let me tell you this, my mom 
had nine brothers and sisters. So there was ten of them all together. Five boys and five girls. As some of you older folks know, it's not uncommon to have larger, larger families back in those days. So growing up, I had nine aunts and uncles on my mom's side of the family. In the span of just a few years, six of them have died. At this moment, my mom and three of her sisters are still living. I have one aunt and all five uncles that have passed away. Now, I'm not trying to make anyone feel uncomfortable by sharing this, uh, this info with you, and you may even be asking, why are you sharing all this personal information with us? But here's the point. Families change. Some of you may come from broken homes like mine was. I know that there are many of you that are listening to this whose stories are a lot worse than mine. I had a great mom. She made sure that my every need was taken care of. Some of you may not have had that. Some of you younger folks may not have a, a mom or dad that is taking care of you. You may be living with aunts or uncles or grandmas. Some of you may have close family who have passed away. A loved one can be taken from us in the blink of an eye. Now I'm not telling you this to scare you. And I'm not telling you this because I think divorce is okay. I'm telling you this because I want you to understand that even family is not the place where we find our ultimate sense of stability. What we have to understand is that the God of the Bible is a God of order. He created us in such a manner that we crave stability. We desire somewhere solid to stand on. And none of us in our right mind would be willing to confess that we love chaos. I think we would all agree that we would love some sort of stability in our lives. This is why I think God's immutability is relevant to those moms posting the funny memes on Facebook. They recognize the fact that this virus has caused chaos around them. Everything in their life has been turned upside down. They or their husband may have lost their job. The kids have been sent home from school. People that they know and love may have become sick or possibly passed away from this virus. They recognize the fact that everything around us is unstable at the moment. However, because of sin, we tend to look for stability in things that are also changing. We try to find our stability in things like relationships, careers, bank balances, or our familiar surroundings, like our homes or our families. It could be any number of things. But the point is, so often we seek stability in this created kingdom that surrounds us. And we don't realize that we are all eventually going to be disappointed by these things. Because everything in creation is subject to change. To find true stability that will last, we must look beyond this created world, ultimately to its creator. Because Scripture tells us God is unchanging. God cannot grow more or less powerful. He can never cease to be holy, just, good, and true. His wisdom and knowledge cannot be increased or decreased. And as we read in Malachi 3.6, the Lord God Almighty does not change. As Christians, we find our hope and we find our stability in the fact that we belong 
to an unchanging God. In John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is where we as Christians find our stability. Not in relationships. Not in our bank balance. Not in our homes. Not in our careers. Not in our families. We find our stability in the fact that God has promised to keep us. And no matter what this life throws at us, nothing will be able to snatch us out of His hand. And since God is unchanging, if you are truly His, you will always be His. Nothing can separate you. It means that He cannot fail to keep His promises to forgive us and protect us forever. These are the majestic truths that the attributes of God can help us as Christians to see. These truths drive us to find our comfort in God and God alone. But, there's also a flip side to this that you do need to be aware of. God's unchangeability is bad news for unrepentant people because it means the Lord will not overlook your sin. Just as He promised to care for and protect His own, He has promised justice and wrath on those who will not repent of their sin. Romans chapter 2 says, Do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself. On the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed, He will render to each one according to His works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, He will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. So in conclusion, for those of you that are one of Christ's sheep, His immutability is a warm blanket for your soul. We find comfort in His promise to love us and keep us. We are His for all eternity. But for those of you who are outside of Christ, let His immutability be a warning to you. He has promised wrath on the unrepentant. And that promise is unchanging as well. So I beg you this morning, come to Christ. Steve, I'm finished. Um, give me just a second and uh, I will say a prayer for us. Good. You want to take a break for a second? No, that's fine. We'll go. He cut Chad's in and out. Okay. So just give him a second. Okay. Let us pray. Our Father, we come to you today and we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the Bible that you have given us, Lord. That you reveal yourself to us, Lord. We pray for knowledge that you would grant us the ability to open your word 
and see your truths. Lord, we know that that task is impossible if you do not send your Holy Spirit to illumine the word for us. So we pray that you would do that as well. Father, we pray that uh, this message would go forth and have results, Lord. I pray that someone will see how relevant, how majestic it is to get to know our God. Father, I pray that this sickness will pass soon, that this virus will move on, and that, Lord, we can be gathered together once again as a body at Beach Grove. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. We are unworthy of your good graces, yet you just pour them out on us. Father, we pray for our pastor. We pray for quick healing and that you would get him back to us, Lord, and so we could follow his lead. Father, we thank you for all that you do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.